today's episode film critic glenn kinney formerly uh, editor of premier magazine he currently writes for a variety of outlets including the new york times and roger ebert.com his new book is made men the story of goodfellas and um it's a great great book um in the interview himself he references uh grail marcus and his books lipstick traces and mystery train and the idea of taking these uh different aspects of pop culture and com- and going in different directions and bringing them all together. Um, and uh, a big chunk of the book is about following the movie of Goodfellas itself. And uh, another aspect of the book, which was really fascinating, is that um, he also compares Wise Guys, the Nicholas Pelleggi book that it's based off, Pelleggi co-wrote Goodfellas with the movie itself with Scorsese. And one aspect that this book really brought to me while reading it is this feeling when I've watched Goodfellas in the past, I've always thought of it as entertainment, fictionalized entertainment. And he uh, compares the real life stories behind it, what's in the book, what's been since learned from the book, what other um, different books based on the events described in the movie and book uh, since then have come to light. Um, And it brought to mind the only time I actually saw Goodfellas with the crowd, um, I had to look it up. It was August, what was it? August 28th, 2010. And the reason I know that date is because it was my last day on the first movie I worked on. And the mix got extended, and I had already made plans to go see, uh, with a bunch of friends, we are going to see Goodfellas at the Hollywood Cemetery. Now, if you've never seen a movie at the Hollywood Cemetery in Los Angeles, it sounds very sacrilegious to be watching movies amongst gravestones. But when you're actually there and you realize how many Hollywood figures are there, it almost comes across as like this celebration of their life's work. And so what had happened was, being my last day, uh, there had been a pre-plan of, you know, done with the, the job, getting drunk. And, but at the same time, we're still poor. So I just remember being, by the time the movie was beginning, I was already kind of uh, gone on a bunch of PBRs, which also dates the time too. And Henry Hill introduced the movie. And I can't, for the life of me, remember what he specifically said. But I think he himself was probably had been drinking too. And he made some crack about being amongst a cemetery and all these dead bodies, and he made some joke about some bodies. If not, he didn't say he was responsible for some of these bodies, but he, was, he made some crack about being responsible for other bodies or something, and he got a laugh. And it annoyed the crap out of me. And since I had already had a few, I started heckling him. And the thing is, it's a big cemetery, so it's not like he heard me. The people around me heard him, but I just started yelling, ah, ha, 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 it's funny because he really killed people. And that may be the only time I really ever thought of him as a real person. Um, there's this great chapter in uh, Kenny's book, I think it's called The Tragedy of Henry Hill, with where him using all these different pop culture uh, references and the real real life stories talks about what happened to Hill after um, he gave up all of his, uh, um, after he testified, went into witness pr- protection, and how he himself had become alcoholic. And uh, Kenny references Howard Stern's book. And Howard Stern at one point, I guess, used to have Henry Hill on as a joke, and Hill would always be drunk, or be drinking a Heineken whenever he came on. And in the book, Stern said, this is like the fourth interview where he was dedicated to um, have a real conversation with them. And he also has a reference to Henry Hill's brother in some other interviews saying that a lot of Hill's alcoholism came from his guilt for having testified against all his old friends. And in this thing, he says like, 
you know, life's miserable without drinking. And he's like, I'm a scumbag. And it's, whenever I heckled Henry Hill, that's probably what he was going through. And another thing that comes up in our conversation with Glenn Kenny later is he had a very, um, he had a relationship with David Foster Wallace. Uh, he had edited some of his pieces at premiere and on his blog has written extensively about it and written very protective of it. And so I asked him about his feelings about the, um, Dave Lipsky book, which was later turned into a movie, uh, into the tour. And Kenny, or Kenny kind of makes, I was happy to hear that he actually liked the book because on the blog, he really tore into the movie and the movie, if you've read the book, I also liked the book and was happy to hear that he, he liked it. But the, the movie is almost a, a complete and utter betrayal of not only David Foster Wallace's ethos, but even certainly what the book was trying to get across. Because the book was an, er- an interview for a Rolling Stone feature for those who haven't read or seen the movie that didn't, that did that got spiked, I guess. And the movie ends up being this just really base, like, commodification of their relationship where it's all about these petty jealousies and it's about um, Lipsky as a writer writing his own book and trying to make his own literary name while doing these side features for a novelist like David Foster Wallace, who's going to be known as, you know, at the time, voice of generation type, type laudits. And Lipsky's book is so much more about it. It's, it's, it's trying to understand the book itself and also about how, once someone creates something like that, that like uh, Foster Wallace was trying to do something nuanced about how it feels to be alive and all the complexity in turn of it. And he knew that he was doing this interview to sell the book and how it was going to be commodified. And the movie in turn takes that story and simplifies it and commodifies it into about two people fighting to sell something. And again, what's fascinating with Kenny's book about Goodfellas is when I heard Henry Hill, when I think now about that time heckling Henry Hill, he was a real person going through some stuff. And I mean, obviously, you know, he was a mobster who killed people, but it's just a complicated subject in terms of adaptation of real stories, them being commodified. And one of the things Kenny's book really illuminates is the entertainment value, the real stories, and it's a great read. And I hope you enjoy the conversation with him. Are you, or where are you at? In Brooklyn? I'm in Brooklyn, yeah. Okay. What, what, um, are you like, you ha- how long have you lived in Brooklyn? About 35 years. Okay. So did you, are you mainly East coast, New Jersey, New York area? Did you ever live outside yeah. of it? Or? No, I've, I've only lived in, I lived in Dublin, Ohio for about two months in 1996 working a job, but I've lived in the same, uh, about a 50 mile radius my entire life. Okay. I didn't know if you had, had to do like a stint in uh, LA for premiere or anything like that. No, I never did. I mean, I visited quite frequently, but uh, we had two offices, um, a New York office and a Los Angeles office. And I, I was in the New York office. Mm. Uh, t- before we were, or, um, we were talking about doing this episode, Ted was mentioning really excitedly, all three of us, I think are, um, uh, big users of letterbox the uh, online service and ted was marveling at the stuff you've been posting lately that you've been watching well i mean you know i i I mainly got on letterbox to just um keep my own diary of what i was watching so i knew what i was watching um which i could have just as well done on paper i suppose but i'm not that disciplined um it just seemed an easier way and so I have been on Letterboxd, and uh, yeah, I just put down everything I watch, and it's kind of um, funny because I, I have some people who follow me who are very um, 
intent on like using my letterbox feed to read tea leaves about what I may or may not be reviewing, <laughs> which is pretty easy to do because if I see something and I don't give it stars or anything like that, and it's something that's not out yet, you know, people can say, <laughs> Oh, you're going to review that. And I, you know, it is a, it's a little, it's a little bit spoilerish, I guess, because there's some people who will, you know, try and ask me, to give my assessment of a film before it's come out. If they see that I've watched it on letterboxd. Are you doing screenings right now in person or just, screeners? no, no, we only do screeners. The New York times has been, it's very protective of its writers and it's been, uh, actively discouraging us from going to, uh, in-person screenings, but in-person screenings haven't been happening too much in New York. Okay. Actually. I mean, I've, I've only heard of one so far and I didn't go. <laughs> I had a friend was telling me he got to go to a screening of the new George Clooney movie and he got the theater solely to himself. And it's the first time he's been in a theater, I think maybe all year even. Oh, wow. That's good for him, I guess. <laughs> he was, it was LA based though. But um, Ted, uh, both all three of us then, I guess, are big into the diarist uh, writing down what you see when you see. Because I know personally, I like to put the date when I saw a movie as like my own journal so i remember where stuff's at and ted's got a really thorough diary of your of the stuff you've written down yeah i'm sorry but uh, no uh, the reason i just i was i've been watching following you glenn is because uh man you've been tearing it up i mean you're all over the map with uh, so many different films and we're about we're about the same we're about a year apart age wise yeah and uh, and to see to see the variety is that has that been typical of you for years now or is that just recently because the COVID? Is it a quarantine thing? Um, yeah i mean i kind of watch you know it's funny um COVID has definitely uh increased my both my watching and my reading uh and um i have a pretty big physical library of films uh so um you know there's a lot to watch and also certain things come in and then there's like my mood, you know, my wife was away for eight weeks. So I kind of was at liberty to watch, you know, anything at any time. And a lot of the times during my wife's absence, I sort of gravitated towards mindless, lurid exploitation films and stuff like that, just to sort of take my mind off of my isolation in a different way than usual. But it, it really is, if I'm not watching it for the reason that I'm reviewing it, uh, it's just, it's just whatever strikes my mood at the time. Or, you know, I get a something I ordered. You know, I've been ordering uh, a certain amount from Vinegar Syndrome, a certain amount from my friends over in England at Powerhouse Indicator. So, if I get their big uh, sweet charity package, I will look at that to see. You know, they do a great job with mastering and authoring and everything. So, I want to look at that. Um, vinegar syndromes. Uh, my friend Jonathan Hertzberg has a new sort of DVD Blu ray imprint called Fun City Editions, and he put out Amos Poe's Alphabet City and uh, a movie from Britain called I Start Counting, which is really fabulous. So, you know, I, I watch those as soon as I get them. And I have the, the powerhouse Fu Manchu box, which I was going through, uh, although now my wife's home, so I may have to pause that. <laughs> Um, do, so you, when you do those seasonal consumer guides on the blog or the Blu-rays, are those stuff you're sent or are the stuff you're buying? Kind of a combination of both. I mean, it's funny. I was actually during the beginning of quarantine, I was going to, uh, write a quarantine type consumer guide and, um, I took notes for, uh, for everything I was watching and I didn't. I never wrote it up. I still may write it up, although I don't really have time. But the movies I had on that, like Action of the Tiger, that ridiculous Van Johnson thing from the 50s where he was trying to do Humphrey Bogart and a have and have not, only in color. And Sean Connery plays his bosun, who's like this really drunk rapist. Um, I did a lot of Kino Lorber stuff, like the Angel, the Lubitsch, picture and the Gary Cooper three films, Boges, General Died at Dawn, Lies of a Bengal Lancer. Then the Bolshevik trilogy from Flickr Alley, which I definitely bought. Captain Kronos, which I definitely bought. 
all these 88 film stuff from Britain that I bought, like the Eight Pole Diagram Fighter and uh, El Esculito de Senora Morales from VCI. I took notes on all this stuff, and I, I never hmm. forced 10 from Navarone, which is terrible. <laughs> uh, the, the Restoration of the Golem, the Restoration of King Creole. Um, so what do you think when they lavish such... Uh... A box set on that four ten from Navarone. I'm like, what the heck? You know, I don't have. I only have the Kino Force ten from Navarone. I don't have the powerhouse version of that, but I'm actually curious. Not curious yeah. enough to buy it necessarily, but I'm definitely curious as to what they put in there. Uh, Force ten from Navarone. I mean, yeah, I don't. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. It's a weird, weird movie. Uh, Because it's kind of like the old school meets the new school, you know, kind of uh, Harrison Ford versus Robert Shaw with Carl Weathers picking up the slack in the middle. Um, (laughs) Very bizarre. Yeah. So let's go ahead and rewind back. So where exactly are you from? Well, Fort Lee, New Jersey, which is the with the birth of Hollywood, really. The birth of the American film industry was right there. Uh, you don't you don't see much of it. There's uh, especially now. Back when I was a kid, there was a film archive that was abandoned and gated up that I always wanted to try and go into, but I think they've torn that down since. There is a there is a road named after Theta Barra in Fort Lee now, though, okay. uh, which you can visit, which you can walk past. And I don't know if people are uh, remember who she was or what, but uh, there is that. So, um, uh, but yeah, that's where I was born, and uh, then we moved to Cliffside Park and various locales around Bergen and Passaic County. Uh, yeah, I moved around New, New Jersey a lot, and then I moved to New York in 1985, I guess. Okay. Do you um, do you remember your first movie, either in the theater or the first one you ever saw? Yeah, my family legend has it that I was sitting between my parents at uh, a drive-in in 1960 uh, when I was one year old, and they were watching Psycho, and I was sort of sitting there being very uh, attentive to it. And this is the legend of my, of my uh, cinephilia, so to speak. Uh, Again, that's very, uh, that's apocryphal. Uh, I do remember being in a drive-in and being in the back seat and seeing the scene in North by Northwest where uh, Cary Grant's Roger Thornhill character has just had a, bottle of bourbon or whiskey poured down his throat and is in a car and trying to not drive off a cliff. I remember that very vividly, and that's a very real memory for me. So that maybe was the first time I, I saw something in a movie that made an impression. It was very uh, engrossing and you know captivating, and it felt dangerous uh, and uh, scary. So I do remember that, and I think then I was about four, maybe. My parents liked to go to the drive-in. I don't understand why. I guess maybe maybe it was economic because it saved them money on a babysitter because they were working-class people, and there wasn't a lot of money to throw around. So I think, you know, they liked to go to movies. Uh, my mom in particular was very avid about film. Um but I think they couldn't always afford a babysitter to go out. This is just occurring to me now. Of course, that's the reason. Uh, why else Why else would they do it? Because they didn't want us around. I mean, they, they liked us. We were fine. But they didn't want us around to go to movies with. But it just made more sense economically to do that. So they'd tell us to go to sleep, and we wouldn't go to sleep. I mean, I wouldn't go to sleep. I'd, I'd but, you were like, probably, but, but you were probably an attentive viewer, watcher, I suppose – if you're if you were making a lot of ruckus, your parents would have you know clamped down on you. Yeah, no, I was uh, very I was very quiet. Yeah, I, I, say, I that was another that was an epiphany for me. I'm this like I said, I'm around the same age, and I'm watching all these. I have memories of all these films I shouldn't have been watching, like Marnie, 
and things like this. And it's because that's what my dad chose and what my mom and dad chose were what we were the drive in. And I think that that kick started my love becoming, you know, a cinephilia because of just because I was watching all these things that were way beyond my age grade, you know. Yeah, there was also a television show on uh, PBS uh, Channel 13 in my New York area that um, was hosted by, uh, I think it's, there were different shows. There was one hosted by Charles Champlin. There was one hosted by Richard Schickel. I think the the PBS one was called Cinema 13, and they would, uh, every week, I think on Saturday night, they would air a foreign film uh more often than not, uh, an older classic like Fritz Lang's M. But sometimes they show something more recent, like Ivan Passer's Intimate Lighting. So I got to see a lot of different things that were kind of all over the map. Um, and then my buddy and I, my schoolmate and I, and were big horror movie fans, and we would go to our local singleplex, so to speak. And uh, I remember very vividly seeing Night of the Living Dead for the first time when I was about 10 or 11. Did you, the, those silent films on Saturday night, was that your choice or your parents' choice or all together? Yeah, that was my choice. I kind of like, um, I just sort of would set, there was maybe two televisions in the house and I would sort of, uh, as the oldest child, I would exercise my droit de seigneur and take over the second television and watch, um, you know, uh, whatever I wanted. How many siblings did you have? I had a brother and a sister. Still have them. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you start to pick up, uh, go and start going to movies on your own? Uh, when I, you know, when I was about 12 or so, I had a big growth spurt. So I got really tall all of a sudden. And it didn't do for much for me socially because I was large and awkward, but because I had... You the could height. sneak into movies. I could, well, yeah, I would not sneak in, but I could. My my pa my pass. my my little buddy, my little buddy Joe, who looked like he was twelve, and I would go check out a film, and we didn't take advantage of it in the way that uh, typical uh, pre adolescents would. We didn't go see, you know, uh, soft core sex movies. We went to see things like. Uh, Dirty Harry or Chinatown or Blazing Saddles. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, we we're in, we we're still in suburban New Jersey. So it wasn't like we were going to see uh, Knife in the Water, but we were going to see whatever we kind of felt like. Uh, and um, so that was kind of our education in terms of uh, popular American film at that point. You know, between that and watching stuff on television. Uh, and then once I got to go into the city, I had an aunt who would uh, take me to see something. You know, I would ask specifically to see something like The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. And my aunt Peggy of the Brooklyn Kennys would uh, <laughs> very happily take me to see that because she thought I was I was showing signs of refinement. What year was that? How would you uh, find out about those films if you when you would go in the city? My parents had a subscription. 1972. Good Christ! I mean, I was like 13 years old, and I was like, "Take me to see the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie." Whatever <laughs> they must have, they did. They, I said, they must have thought I was a freak, but I, I mean, they did think I was a freak. Um, that was a problem with me growing up. Uh, I was considered a freak, but yeah, that was my thing. And how did I know about them is because my parents had subscribed to the New York Times and because they thought they were working class people. They had ambitions uh, as parents in the 60s did uh, to for their kids to, you know, have advantages that they didn't have. So they thought the New York Times was uh, an improving publication, so to speak. Little did they know. Um, <laughs> now now I write happen? now I write for them. What a concept. Um and it is an improving publication. I will say that. Uh, but um, so I would see ads for these films and they seemed interesting to me. I, don't, I mean, I don't really know where it came from. I used to think maybe I was just incredibly pretentious and affected as a child. But it was also that this stuff, for whatever reason, genuinely appealed and spoke to me. So I just followed it. You know, it's hard to explain. Um, I don't, I, I don't know if I was being weird for the sake of being weird, but it was just where it took me, you know? What was the first Scorsese movie? 
probably uh, it was mean streets you know i went with my buddy and we looked at each other during the opening credits with the with be my baby and the eight millimeter movies and we just sort of were like okay this guy is uh I mean, I can't, he's, you know, older than we are and, and all this other stuff, but he's like by 17, 20, 17 years or so. But like this guy is from the same place we are from, you know, with a divide of almost 20, 20 years. So we saw that and we were impressed by that. Yeah. I was going to say it's still to this day, one of the best opening music cues ever. It still works. Yeah. That title sequence. No. Yeah. I mean, and and people in my friend's family, Jersey City Italian Americans, we knew Italian Americans. I knew we we knew we knew these guys. So that was a big draw. But it wasn't just the fact that we had a, felt you know an affinity with the characters because they're not really appealing characters after a certain. The, the thing about Mean Streets is you're watching it, and like for the first you know twenty minutes, thirty minutes, hour or so. You know, these are guys with their problems, but as the as the movie goes on and the problems get more pronounced, the way these characters react to them becomes more unappealing. And by the end of the movie, they're just really unlikable. And it kind of um, it's one of the interesting paradoxes of the movie. It's one of the ways that the movie breaks from classical uh, cinema or classical narrative and becomes a, a really modernist work is the fact that it leaves these characters in complete suspension at the end. You don't know what happens to them. Are they dead? Are they alive? You know, thing, you know, if they do end up alive, the ones that do live through it, it's not going to be pleasant to come back from, but you don't know. The movie just cuts off. There is, you know, Charlie with his hand to his neck, stumbling, with a fire hydrant going crazy and, you know, sirens going off and that's the end. Um, that, you know, and I mean, that came from, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, that came from Godard to a certain extent, sure, but it also came from Scorsese's own, again, this was something he saw and he followed it, you know, and, um, but it spoke to us in an interesting way uh, about art and about narrative. You didn't have to do the pat ending where everything's wrapped up in a neat bow and, you know, you have the sense of reassurance and coming across that kind of modernism when you're a kid, um, can either throw you off to a certain extent or it can be really revelatory. You know, I ended up aesthetically living in that place ever since then. So, um, where did, uh, where did punk come in or where did music start to come in? Yeah, I was I was a big music kid. I, I my, maybe music even before film. I was a big uh, as a little boy. I was a big Beatle maniac. I begged my parents to get me a Beatle record when I was like five years old, and they did. They bought me you know, for Christmas of nineteen sixty four. They bought Beatles sixty five for me, and because uh, it was out in you know late nineteen sixty four. And that was the first record I ever owned. And I wore that out. You know, that was a huge thing for me. And I had all those different reactions that kids have to that kind of music at the time. You know, the Beatles were approachable and friendly. Um, the Rolling Stones were threatening and unsavory. Uh, you know, and you, as a Catholic boy, I tried to, you know, side with the Beatles most of the time. But once I got into the Stones and the Velvet Underground, then you started thinking differently. You didn't really think of these things in terms of their actual musical content as much as the semiotics of what the groups represented. Um, so uh, that was kind of a, I think that's a, that became kind of a practical fallacy of rock criticism itself, you know, and I became a rock critic and I um, very quickly became not, I wouldn't say disillusion because that's a little pompous, but I, I became dissatisfied with my mode of rock criticism very quickly after doing it professionally for a while because I realized I really didn't know what I was talking about. Like I really didn't know what really? I was talking about. Like I because, But in the same way that so many other critics don't know what they're talking about because they have no working technical understanding of music and no understanding of the music the vocabulary of music or anything like that and they're talking about they're talking about noises 
organized in a certain way, but they have no vocabulary to apprehend or describe it. And so they talk about lyrics all the time and wow. image and stuff. And that's, you know, lyrics yeah. and image are a big part of rock and roll, but they're not everything. So I found my own lack of knowledge frustrating uh, as a music critic. I know in the book, uh, in the most recent, the the Goodfellas book, like your your technical stance on film is pretty spot on because I find myself really annoyed with a lot of the ways critics typically write about film or have they always seem to have this like anecdotal, half wrong, half right description of how films are made, and you seem to like really do your research on a lot of this too. Well, I mean, that's the thing. My own reaction to how rock criticism was done, I think, informed my approach to film criticism to a certain extent, but I also don't think that I acquired, you know, I, I still think I'm learning a lot and I started sure. to acquire a much more technical appreciation of how film was done and, and film language. You know, I, I, I always tell them, I, I teach language of film now and I feel, you know, that I know enough that I am actually qualified to do it, but I always tell my kids, you know, uh, there's a textbook we use sometimes, which is David Bordwell's uh, uh, film art and introduction, which he co-wrote with his wife, Kristen Thompson. That's an amazing book. And there's really thorough and incredibly uh, articulate and informed in its uh, description of the technique of film. I mean, David is, is unstoppable in that respect, but I also tell my kids uh, one film book you could use as a primer on the actual language of film is uh, the book of interviews with Francois Truffaut and Alfred Hitchcock mm. because of how he walks uh, Truffaut through uh, his ideas of montage, his ideas about sound, his ideas about editing. You know, when a, when a, when a young person reads Hitchcock saying that, the fun that he has in terms of making the film is in the development process and in the editing and that the shooting is drudgery that blows kids minds because they think that shooting is like everything True, because it's yeah. the most, because it's the most laborious labor intensive and communal um, part, it's the part of, that's on the EPKs too. Yeah. So they think that's the main thing because of how can you have a film if you don't shoot it? I mean, obviously that's the sure. that's the, a given. But once you can actually understand what Hitchcock was saying there, then your awareness of and openness to the possibilities of how film is made becomes a whole other ball game. Uh, and that to me is uh, fascinating. Um, so, so your music criticism, you would have been, this would have been at the village voice when you started out. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I, I worked for my college paper and I wrote a lot of embarrassing stuff at my college paper. Um, most of which I understand has been pulped, which is great. Um, <laughs> I mean, I did some really stupid things there. I, I reviewed a jazz concert by Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, and I ridiculed the small size of Mel Lewis's drum kit. Mm -hmm. I really did that. Um, and I felt horrible about it ever since. And I buy every Thad Jones and Mel Lewis record I can As lay my hands on this penance. Yes. And they are really great. And they are both really great musicians. And I was a completely insufferable uh, horror show. But I mean, that's what college papers were good for. You got to run out being a completely insufferable horror show, whereas most young writers now do it in public. Um, so I guess I had some talent and I, uh, you know, tried to apply that in the outside world. And I did ended up doing okay. I got published a spec piece, got published by musician magazine, which is no longer, uh, no longer exists, but was owned by billboard. It was a pretty big, thing so i wanted to write for the village voice and i conducted a correspondence with their music editor robert Criscow, who's a very great editor and a, editor and a very great critic um 
and I started writing for The Voice, and that was fun. Uh, it was educational in ways both social and professional. Mm-hmm. And um, it helped me get a full-time job at a magazine called Video Review, where I actually rewrote the test reports. One of the things that was a big deal at Video Review were test reports of home video equipment, camcorders, uh, VHS players, um, laser disc players. This is before Blu-rays or uh, DVDs. Uh, and I learned more, you know, I've forgotten more about video technology, all, all of which is now obsolete mm-hmm. than most people ever knew. And, uh, you know, you uh, signal the noise ratios and this and that. And it's really interesting stuff. And so I got a technical vocabulary in that, which is worthless now. But I also started writing about film there because we reviewed uh, laser discs, and I was a big I was immediately a big laser disc person, mm. um, you know, and we had a lot of great film critics on our roster. We worked with Andrew Saris and Molly Haskell, uh-huh. um, Schickel wrote for us, Neil Gabler, um, William K. Everson, the very, very great film historian was a writer for video review. And I actually showed him how to work a laser disc player when the first laser disc of, uh, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation was released. So uh, that, too, was very educational. And meeting people who were film collectors uh, and seeing obscure films on 16 millimeter uh, in, in people's living rooms and and building a collection of stuff on uh, VHS. So I would write about Laserdisc. So I, I was, I, you know, this is all the way back in 1985, uh, 86, and I would, you know, do assessments of commentaries on laser discs i heard the uh the scorsese schrader commentary on uh, the taxi driver laser disc which you know was never was only revived uh many years the later Criterion one yeah the criterion one that and that was something else that was pretty amazing um so you know stuff like that was also again fun educational all that good stuff um and you know, gave me a chance to uh, to practice a certain kind of criticism right off the bat. That was very helpful later on. I mean, I didn't actually write film criticism in terms of new releases until the mid '90s when I was at Premiere Magazine, and I was I wasn't brought on to Premiere Magazine as a critic. I was brought on as an editor, as a journalist, like with just because. Well, of the... what happened was the guy who was at Premier had a huge staff turnover, and the guy who became editor in chief after that was a guy named Jim Meggs, who had worked with at Video Review. And what he year called. Was this? That was nineteen ninety six. Okay. He called me up, and he had. Um, he initially called me in to do a tech section. Again, the the Video Review thing. He wanted me to. This is around the time when DVDs were just starting, and he wanted me to do a tech section where I talk about, you know, I commission articles about DVDs and home theater was getting really big at the time. And so that's what he wanted me to come in for. I came in and I did that. And um, then he, uh, he had other stuff for me to do. He was a little shorthanded. And one of the things he asked me to do was edit a, a piece that had, he had found in the bottom drawer of his uh, desk when he first came on that had been commissioned a year before uh, by uh, two editors behind him, a uh, piece by David Foster Wallace about the making of Lost Highway. This is, a, this is the first piece that you were working on when you got to premiere? Well, it was like the second or third, yeah, after I did the tech section. Because he okay. saw that I was reading Infinite Jest, and he thought, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, call this guy up and see what we can do, because he's already, like, been through one editor and they didn't have a good experience together. And since you're reading him, you seem to have a sense of what he's about. Maybe you can mollify him. So I did. And that was, uh, that, ma- that piece was nominated for a national magazine award. So Jim thought, well, maybe I should hire Glenn full time. Um, and, uh, so that happened. And then a couple of years into doing that, uh, it became, um, well, we should have a film review section and Glenn should write the reviews. And I'm like, you know, I'm just sitting there minding my own business. And they're like, yeah, you should be the film critic. I'm like, okay. 
I was like, I was like Pete Davidson on one of those Saturday Night Live sketches. Like, okay, yeah. just a lot of the tattoos showing up, and um, well, no, not, not do... in terms of the tattoos, just the sort no. of like, okay. I do want to do a deep dive into Premiere, but I had two things I wanted to uh, go back on to. One of the things I've always liked about your writing is you've always struck me, and you, you touched on this earlier, as a music critic writing film criticism. And I I had a huge obsession with Lester Bangs for a while, and I read a lot of Lester Bangs into your work. Is that fair, or is that just kind of an offshoot? Uh, off well, I, you know, I actually try and write less like Lester Bangs than I used to. Um, cause I think Lester as a, as you know, was a great writer, but I also think he was one of a kind and that trying to emulate him is, uh, a, um, a bad idea, but I see it a lot in the tangentialness and like, but the knowledge too, like, cause it's funny hearing you just like go really like, trash your own level of knowledge. And me and Ted before recording, we're just like, we're never going to see as many movies as Glenn Kenny's seen. Well, thank you. But uh, I mean, I met Lester Bangs twice. I, I, I was a real fan of his and I, 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 I kind of, you know, I kind of worshipped him in the same way that uh, the Cameron Crowe did and, and the, the, the kind of thing that he transferred to the Patrick Fugit character and Almost Famous. Um, you know, that was my, I, I, you know, I wasn't, of course, close to Lester at all, but I, I remember going to see Iggy Pop on his... Uh, tour of the united states after um for the i guess was it the idiot or lust for life but it was like 1977 and he was playing at the academy of music and i took my uh took a a, a girl from high school um who i still talk to on facebook um very nice girl but we never really got anywhere um she had to go home to college campus that night we were both just starting school and i ran into lester bangs in the lobby and i was like lester <laughs> bangs you know <laughs> i love you i write for my college paper be my friend you know that kind of shit and uh, he said oh yeah I, that's how i started too i wrote for my school paper I was like thank you and then i you know a, a year or two later i went to see his band at cbgb and I wore this Felix the Cat T-shirt, and he said, "I like your T-shirt." Like, Lester <laughs> Bags, Lester Bags likes my T-shirt. So yeah, I was a total Bangs worshiper. But I, you know, and you know, again at my college paper, I, you know, I spent one summer. I was, I worked as a production assistant on a porno movie in New York, and I wrote this like two thousand, three thousand word. Um, story, the you know, set diary that I published in my college paper that was like the worst kind of bangs ripoff, and I was like fired from my college paper for doing it, more or less. So, don't do that, guys. Don't do that at home, kids. But speaking of porn, that brings up you mentioned David Foster Wallace, um, the literary aspect. I feel like you're one of, like there's there's not critics, you know, obviously have to be pretty um, facile with the, or good with writing in general. But like you only think of like the more eloquent ones being like Roger Ebert or Pauline Kael or James A.G. But like you seem to have a really strong literary influence too. What were you reading in your teen years and into your twenties? Um. I was pretty voracious. I read a lot of, um, I read Anthony Burgess. I read Jean Genet. I read William S. Burroughs. I read Jerzy Kaczynski. Um, uh, I read, uh, my mother was very big into murder mystery. So we read a lot of Dashiell Hammett together, Raymond Chandler, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I then I discovered Nabokov, which kind of opened up a whole world for me, but also ruined mm. me to a certain extent. Because mm. in your twenties, you know, to worship Nabokov in your twenties is to kind of like share all of his bad ideas, uh, which he had quite a few. And so, as a result, I never even read uh, Dostoevsky until I got into my forties, because Nabokov was so down on Dostoevsky. I thought, why bother? 
But Nabokov was like, he also got me into writers like Raymond Cuno and Alain Rob Grier. So that was very useful. Uh, Gogol, I read Gogol because of Nabokov. Um, so, I mean, it was a good influence and a bad influence in certain ways. But also, I mean, there's something about his kind of like Mandarin insufferability that's not a very good um not a very good fit on a kid from Jersey. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of kind of both went both ways. Mm-hmm. I've been going through my old premiere stuff, um and uh I, I I quote Nabokov a lot in my old reviews. It's very um affected. Um really? yeah, I, well I find it that way now. But I mean I have to forgive myself. Um, you know, my, my, my premiere stuff is very brash, very, uh, but I mean, it was partially me, but it was also partially the times and the sort of sense of competition with entertainment weekly, where you have this kind of like, just like, Hey, I'm the authority. This is where it's at. And I'm going to like hit you with this, you know, fancy prose and, uh, offbeat opinions sort of thing. Uh, well, I recently feel like I heard you talk about your days at Premiere where it felt like you were bringing a rock critic's kind of, um, or a rock star's lifestyle to the film criticism or to the <laughs> practice itself. Well, yeah, you know, I was, I was indulged, you know, I, I got away with murder over there. I was, a, you know, um, I don't say that by way of bragging. Um, mm, sure, sure. It's just, you know, I would, people, people found it romantic, you know, that I was this kind of semi disheveled, um, hard drinking, uh, night crawler film critic dude. Um, I, I guess I found it kind of romantic too, but, uh, it didn't really do much for my health. Um, how long you did know, that last? You know, too long, honestly. Mm. Um, but um, it is what it is. I can't say, you know, and I do think I produced, okay, you know, some good work during that period, you know, and I say that I look at my old stuff uh, and I don't like it. I mean, it's definitely not, it's not like it has no relation to the stuff I'm doing now. There's definitely a relation to it. And, I think the development of the style that I use in my book, uh, Made Men, the story of Goodfellas, couldn't have existed without the excesses of my style at Premiere. My mm. ten, my my idea, and you talk about this. I think you're the idea of. Um, I like drawing connections in in cultural, in considering cultural objects and cultural subjects, and I like going exploring things and going down rabbit holes uh a a good friend of mine who's a very brilliant man and a very great writer himself um just finished the book and he sent me a note today which is very complimentary uh but it was kind of more than complimentary because he says i kind of in the book invented my own genre of a kind of a history slash critique that no one else has ever done before which i was very flattered to hear but, you know, it definitely has antecedents. Um, and I would say one of the antecedents is Grail Marcus's book, Mystery Train, which is a piece of rock criticism. And That's a big tad uh, favorite. Another ant- another antecedent, I think, is the, the Pete Frame family, tre- rock family trees. Oh, yeah. Um, where you just sort of like, you, you, you follow this trail and where it goes and, you know, where it ends up. You know, I like things like the fact that you know, Lou Reed inducted Frank Zappa in the Hall of Fame and these two guys didn't really have a lot in common or didn't really have much personal affection for each other. But one thing that united them aesthetically was this love of doo-wop music. And I actually get to put that in a book about Goodfellas, Hmm. not because I'm showing off my erudition, although in a certain respect it feels like that, but because of the fact that doo-wop has a specific function on the soundtrack of this movie. So those connections that I like to draw, I don't think I would have that sense of how to do that if I hadn't been this kind of like, I won't say dilettante, but this sort of like cultural adventurer over the years of my 
professional life or, or my non-professional life. Well, I was going to say that I, what's funny is I jumped back to your, um, the introduction you wrote for the, that star Wars anthology, uh, galaxy, not so far away. Yeah. Uh, after I was finishing or I reading the book and it seems like the, the, the Goodfellas book, the style is much calmer, but Ted finished the book before I did. And he described it almost like you were, writing a commentary like you were watching oh yeah i was gonna say is that it's like you know when you it was how he sold me on the book too (laughs) you have these audio commentaries and they start talking about one scene and then five more scenes go by and you don't get to hear what you thought the commentary on that scene because it's it's a a time constraint whereas this book is a beautiful thing because it's like uh it's like an audio commentary but in book form but you get to cover every single scene. And you get scene. to finish the thought. And, 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 and continue it. It's almost like I, now I'm ready to go back with the book and the movie at the same time after I've read the book and, and go through it that way. Yeah, that's definitely the luxury that prose affords you is that you don't have to be, you know, kind of keeping up with what's going on and talking through it. You know, we have uh, Nick Pinkerton and I recently did an audio commentary for um, – Wolf of Wall Street, and uh, we were talking, really? you know, it's a long movie, and um, we were worried a little beforehand because, like, well, you know, we have to have enough material to fill up the three hours, and, uh, you know, I made notes. Nick likes to work sometimes with a full script. I don't necessarily like to work with a full script. I like to work with an outline, and especially if I'm doing it with a partner, see where the exchange goes and that worked out pretty well this time and uh, you know i was right because we wouldn't not only do we not run out of things to talk about but you know we wouldn't exhaust what we were talking about in time you know in in the amount of time that it took for the scene to complete itself so i hopefully on the finished product uh, you know i haven't listened to the edited version yet hopefully on the finished product those gaps don't uh, show, I think the the editor, the person's working with them, says that that it worked out great. But you know, um, there was plenty of material there. So, um, but I don't, I don't like. I, I like to organize my commentaries in such a way where that doesn't happen, where we're still talking about the scene five scenes after it's over. No, Ted had a nice compliment for you earlier that I oh, think he's too was, shy to say saying, right No, now. no, I'll, I'll go ahead. It was, it was like when I got the book I was, and I heard about it, I go, oh, this would be great. And I I couldn't read it fast enough. It was so fun to read. And like you said, all the different rabbit holes and, and crossovers. I loved it. But then I also, not only did I couldn't read it fast enough, I didn't want it to end because there was so much to um, – to uh, luxuriate in and I, I just I thought you did a really good job and I love that I'm a big mystery train uh, my uncle turned me on to that book and Grill Marcus and um, it seems like I really loved uh, you drawing in different things and going and mentioning other movies and things that cross talk to each other and echo each other I think that's a very important in, in cinema and I think your book just does that very very well I appreciate that yeah um I'm actually still finishing the book. I just finished the uh, movie section of the book, and Ted uh, alerted me that I have the best parts of the book still to look forward to. Uh, you get a whole section of music on all the songs. It's great. The breakdown on the songs is just fantastic. I noticed that Tarantino seems to be doing that lately. Have you seen his uh, essays over on the, uh, the New Beverly? New Beverly? Oh, he yeah, sure. A, he, yeah, he does like he, he starts out on Escape from Alcatraz, and all of a sudden he's off on a tangent on Charles Bronson or something and goes off way off and then comes and then he draws him back in, you know. Yeah, no, he's fascinating. He could use an editor though. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I like the thing he did in Video Watchdog with Tim Lucas about his um sequels. Fifty favorite sequels. That was one of the yeah. best things I've ever read. That's incredible. I did want to go back one last time to David Foster Wallace. I feel like uh, in the stuff I've read of yours, you've been very protective of the stuff you published of his. And I know you were particularly annoyed with the um, end of the tour movie too. Yes, I was. Did uh, you feel the same way about the book? The, cause I actually, no, the I actually like, I, I thought the I book the was book okay. Too. Yeah. The book was fine. Uh, the movie was a whole other issue. Uh, Commodification and, uh, crap. Yeah. Just a lot of, yeah, it, you know, I, I thought everything about it was kind of wrong, and I uh, I didn't think Siegel was particularly good as David. I didn't like the whole 
it was kind of funny. I mean, I felt, you know, after a while I felt bad for David Lipsky because he, in the film, he just kind of becomes a stooge, you know, and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, that the, the lesser talented writer, supposedly, or at least the way the, the well, movie you know, mythologizes. It's like his, his best selling book is still this, you know, it's not the art fair, you know? Um, and I you know, I'm unfamiliar with the art fair. That's the book he's trying to get Dave to read the, the his uh, own novel. So uh, I don't know. It sort of becomes this thing where, you know, you've made this commodity of this, of this, of this object you have that you just happened because of happenstance that you have all these tapes and that's now you. Uh, so, that's that's your that's your body of work. Um, I I was uh, thinking of your writing the other day on. Uh, do you remember? It would have been around twenty eleven. Do you remember getting really mad at? Um, it was a New York Times essay about. I remember getting um, really it, mad all through twenty eleven. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, it was about the phrase, it was either cinematic vegetables or cultural vegetables. Oh God. Yeah, no, we're not going to talk about that. Um, (laughs) it was, I can tell you exactly when it was, I can tell you exactly when it was, and it wasn't 2011. It might've been, I felt guilty because I liked the phrase basically. I, 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 I I remember the essay having some like really silly observations in it, but I Uh... I remember thinking the phrase the other day. That's fine. I mean, you can like the phrase, but no, I remember exactly. It was the night that Steve Reich was playing Carnegie Hall. I I liked it as a phrase because there are certain movies that I know while I'm watching. I was thinking about it. Actually, it was a few episodes back. um, I was thinking about because I was watching Hard to Be a God and the movie did not engage me within the first 10 minutes because I was distracted and I wasn't paying attention to details. So it was not the movie's fault. It was my fault. And so I finished the next three hours of the movie appreciating the movie. But I remember thinking, like, I need to see this movie again and a better thing. And the phrase seemed to apply to it. It was just like, I'm taking my... I always have you have a first viewing where I was kind of a what happens next, where I just understand what's happening in the movie. And then a few years later, I'm going to see it and appreciate it for the context of it better. But it just felt like a phrase... It just The phrase fit whenever I was watching it. I, I, I see Hard to Be a, a God as a screwball comedy, so I don't know what you're even getting at. <laughs> I've watched that movie. I've, I've seen that movie about 12 times. 12 times. It just gets funnier every time. <laughs> Ooh, it's, like, okay. it's, like, it's like three hours worth of what, how do you know he's king because he, he hasn't got shit all over him. <laughs> really, everybody's got shit all over him. No, that movie is amazing to me. Uh, if you think that's hard stuff, have you ever seen uh, Zulowski's uh, on the Silver Globe? Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. We were Damn. just uh, Ted, Ted like, and I just did an episode on possession, and we were talking about it. Alienating science fiction movies. Now I think Garman, Alexei Garman, is a god of cinema. So um, you know everything he does, I, I lap up. Was the Silver trial Globe on... have like like inner titles for the stuff that wasn't shot? Yeah, no, or... he he shoots himself in a store mirror or something and he tells you well this next sequence we shot and uh this was fucked up by so and so and that's how he interconnects it so but at least garman got you know his his kid and his widow completed uh hard to be a god relatively seamlessly but Mm -hmm. um garman also made some great uh great world war ii movie trial on the road uh the russians make the best world war ii movies it's Mm -hmm. all snow cigarettes jammed machine guns and horrible nazis um every single one in, except come and see which doesn't have snow um <laughs> I, I guess next up is uh, I should ask you about girlfriend experience. Your own girlfriend uh, you, experience. You can you can ask me about girlfriend experience. Uh, again, <laughs> yeah. Was this, I mean, through, was this through Brian Copeland and David Levine? Yeah, I met Brian and David in '98 on the set of Rounders. They got very interested in me the second time I went to the set in February of '98 because I had just come back from Las Vegas, where I was spending 
where I went with David Foster Wallace to write about the AVN Awards. So they were like, what's going on? I said, oh, I just got back from Vegas where I was with, you know, because I was seeing them in Atlantic City in a casino. And I was like, oh, it's like being in Vegas again, uh, except no porno. And they were like, Yo, you you were hanging out with David Foster Wallace at the AVN Awards? What was that like? And that was the beginning of our friendship. And then 10 years later, 2008, uh, Premiere had folded. I had spent a better part of about eight months working for the Premiere website, which was miserable. I got fired from the Premiere website. I uh, started becoming a stay-at-home drunk. I weighed 300 pounds and I'm going to my therapist and I run into Brian Koppelman and his uh, then small child, Sam, uh, who was about 10 at the time. Um, and I frightened him. I was a frightening <laughs> figure. Um, and I, you know, I was completely depressed and my life was falling apart and Brian looked me up and down and said, Hey, how do you like to be in a movie that we're doing where you can play the Harry Knowles of escort reviewers. <laughs> and I said, you know, I've got nothing else going on right now, so why not? And soon, and there I was, cast in the girlfriend experience, which was being made not from a full script, but from a 17 to 20 page outline that Brian and David had written after uh, informing Steven Soderbergh what a girlfriend experience was. They were, uh, hold up one weekend at the St. Regis working on a rewrite project for a film that never happened. And I'm not sure I'm allowed to say what it was. It was based on a novel and the novel has since actually been adapted into a very bad film, but this one they were working with would have been a much better film. But again, I'm, I don't think I'm allowed to say <laughs> what it is even after all these years. And I guess they went, good, they, good thing they you went, teased it out. They went down to the King Cole room and Stephen saw this couple and he thought there was something weird off about them. And it was an older man and a very young, elegant, attractive woman. And Brian was like, oh, that's girlfriend experience. And Stephen's like, what's girlfriend experience? And, oh, you never heard of that? No, 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 no. So Stephen's like, aha, I must make a film out of this. And he uh, had this deal with Mark Cuban and Paul Todd Wagner to make these digital films. And the principle of the digital film was that um, he wanted to make them not according to like dogma style rules, but he had a, his own parameters for making them. He would not use a full script. He would not use professional actors. He would get a, a an outline and he would have the actors improvise the dialogue. And so that's how the idea for Girlfriend Experience came in. And I was told to research in, in, in the world of escorting, um, there are men who are referred to as hobbyists. And these hobbyists run their own websites and they solicit escorts and have sex with them and run reviews of them. And these guys are the bane of the existence of high-priced escorts because they will complain about things. I'm not going to get into too much more detail because it's kind sure. of disgusting. Mm -hmm. They'll uh, they'll complain, you know, uh, about things, um, and it's really kind of distasteful. So I was being asked to play one of these people. Sure. So you uh, research everything and then improv? No, I didn't research everything. I researched oh, some oh, stuff. research. You did some research. Yeah, I did. I you know I didn't see an escort, but I remember going to the set for the first time. I shot for two days and I had to write my review. And me and Greg Jacobs actually had to sit down and go to a couple of sites to get the tone. And it was really upsetting. Um, so, yeah, the first thing I had to do was be on the phone with Chelsea, Chelsea, the escort played by Sasha Gray, a lovely young woman. And I had to talk her into meeting me in person, meeting my character in person. I had I decided the name of my website and the name of my uh, persona would be um, the erotic connoisseur. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked that no one, that no one had actually in the real world, no one had actually taken that. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. So I could use it because no one had taken it. So I was the erotic connoisseur and um, I had to give this character a, you really want to work with me kind of sales pitch. 
it was very Harvey Weinstein, actually. Mm. We actually talked about this and somebody said, yeah, it's, it's kind of a Harvey Weinstein, you really want to work with me kind of pitch. We didn't even have to talk about the sexual component because obviously given the scenario of a guy and an escort, the sexual component's built in. But we weren't even thinking about well, Harvey's no, no. own about Harvey's own depredations in that respect, but just Harvey's kind of general way of pitching people, male or female, that you really want to work with me. I can do all this great stuff for you. So that was my thing. And he had me on the phone with her. I was in in another room and she was out on a on a patio in the same apartment. And he told me to just, you know, talk her into it until she agreed. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get a, a woman who's a professional escort to give me a freebie. This is outside my realm of expertise. But, you know, he... And he was shooting her outside talking to me as I was hectoring her because that's essentially what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we got to a certain point and he yelled cut. That was fine. And then I had the in-person meeting with her about a week later. It's a very quick shooting schedule. I think they shot for 14 days and then he took about five days for reshoots. Shit. Um, I mean, he was doing it all digitally. He was his own. It was was the early days of being his own cinematographer and all this other stuff. The whole point of these things was to do them quick. Um, Mm. And he still shoots very uh, relatively quickly. I've always heard him talk going fast. I just, I mean, like 21 days is like the like typical amount of days for like the like lowest rung budget movies right now. So, but I mean, it makes sense considering how fast he's uh, gotten supposed. um, But what is, so is that your, I mean, I know you you said you don't want to, you're not reviewing Soderbergh movies. Is that your connection with them? Just the movie or do you guys, did you know people around his his team or what? Yeah, my wife works for him. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's the that's the end of that. That's uh, <laughs> the explanation there. Uh, yeah, he he pay, he pays my health insurance. Okay, well, there's that conflict um, conflict of interest. It's a complete. Co- by the way, and it has nothing to do with my being on girlfriend experience. It's just something happened completely outside of that 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 uh, that resulted in her taking a job in his office okay you know if we if we need to cut anything i can, we can cut anything it's fine, well, it's fine. No i mean it's, she's on imdb oh <laughs> easy enough uh i was gonna say ted and i both uh watched um the late de niro movie stone because of your book the yeah, oh, yeah. Book, when we both discovered it because of that yeah it was one of those films that the the trailer played we had a we have a manager here at a family owned theater, he'll, he'll play the interesting trailers and it never came. It never came here. I had to go hunt it down after your book came out. Cause I, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm in that mode and, and we're the same age. There was a period where every De Niro film was an event. You'd go and you knew you were in for something. And now it's just like, Oh, I don't know. I'm starting the aughts to go down. Well, right. So and, I, have a, I have a funny story about that, you know, and it was interesting too, because you know, the anatomy of an actor books were all formatted. They were published by fade on coyote cinema and they all have to adhere to a strict format. And it's very French. Um, <laughs> you know, you have to have a filmography and the filmography is director, producer, screenwriter, set decorator. They don't want production designer. They don't want art director. They want set decorator. And if you put art director in instead of the set decorator, they'll say, no, that's the art director. Put in the set decorator. And then the cast. And that's the filmography at the end of the book. So because it's strictly formatted, it has to fit a certain folio, folio being the page count. So, you know, it's a, it becomes a matter of things being art directed to a certain extent where you know, if you have, you know, column B that's going longer, that means you're going over the allotted folio and you have to cut from column A. So at the end of doing the De Niro Anatomy of an Actor book, he had a film coming out every two weeks. So I had to add a new film every two weeks uh, you know, before submitting the final manuscript. And every time I added a film, that was 10 lines that because it would go over the folio that was allotted, that was 10 lines I had to cut from my main text. Oh, man. So I had about 
three weeks of this nightmare of cutting stuff from my actual book so I could put in this stupid filmography entry of 10 lines where I make sure that I know who the fucking set decorator is because they won't accept it if it's a, if it's a designer or an art director. Hilarious. But the thing about the the other thing about the format was that you have sidebars and you get to talk, you get an intro and you get an outro. So you get to talk about all the matter of the career, but the 10 chapters are 10 specific films over the course of the career that are going to give you the sense of the quote anatomy of an actor unquote. And towards the end, I'm getting a little stuck for stuff. You know what I'm saying? So stone actually was a godsend because it's a good movie. It's a good De Niro performance. And I was friendly with Edward Norton and he would talk to me about it. And I almost gave Mm -hmm. that whole chapter to Edward and he was great, you know, but it's also a good movie. And I mean, he's made good movies since then, but they're kind of few and far between. Yeah, how do you? I mean, uh, what's your what? Well, I, I was trying to read that, uh, reread it last night. What is your take? What is he just? Uh, that's just the, his uh, mantra now. Is just to, uh, to take the money and run, put it into Tribeca, or no, no, no. I don't think it's. I don't think it's that crass. I think it's a lot of different things. You know, I interviewed Christopher Walken uh, when I was at premiere, and I, you know, he was it was during a period when he was appearing in a lot of, you know, co-starring with The Rock and this that, and the other thing, and you know. And I think it's something we don't understand as uh, outsiders um, because we don't we we haven't suffered what they've suffered, which is literally years of rejection. Um, you know, De Niro went through almost the entire 1960s not getting work and auditioning and not getting work, and Christopher Walken went through long years of not getting work. If you're an actor, you have to have an unusually thick skin. And you have to take rejection well. And then when you stop getting rejected and you start getting work, then you don't want to stop working. So that's one part of it. Walken was very frank with me when I put the question to him because I was comfortable enough to be able to put the question to him of like, why do you do what you do? Your, your filmography is all over the place. He says, this is my job. I'm a performer. This is what I do. And if people want me to do it, I will do it for them. I think De Niro feels similarly, but also um, if you read Sean Levy's biography of De Niro, which is very good, um, De Niro has a lot of business interests um, and not all of them have been usually successful. De Niro also pays alimony. He pays child support. I don't think he pays child support anymore, but he did pay child support, but he pays alimony. He's been married a bunch of times. Um, And, you know, in his current divorce, from Grace Hightower, she's seeking a lot of money. So mm-hmm. there is a financial aspect to it as well. I think it's largely that he wants to keep working. That makes sense. I guess I was just kind of comparing it to like the 80s or something like that, where he was being more choosy. Well, and also, to be fair, I mean... As I don't even gun- know it was he was being more choosy so much as he had an agent who was trying to get him to certain places in his career. And once he got to those places, he could then take advantage of the fact that he would be offered a lot of money to do stuff. You have to remember that we as cinephiles saw Robert De Niro as a movie star 10 years before he was actually a movie star. I was going to say, you, you mentioned that in the book specifically. Yeah. Like, it was midnight, mid, Harry, Harry Ufflin's his own agent said he'll never be a movie star. He doesn't have it in him. But he wanted it, and he got it, and that was Midnight Run. And how many years into his career was Midnight Run? It was more than 10 years into his film career. If you go from, uh, you know, Born to Win or something like that to uh, Midnight Run, it's almost 15 years. So, you know, he, he made okay money, but also the films were being made at a slower pace. They took more time to make. He needed to take a year off, you know, six months or however long off to make to do raging bull to gain the weight so and then once stardom came then all sorts of possibilities opened up including the the possibilities of being in really bad films you know i think at the time he was doing raging bull the possibility for him to get work in films of those caliber did not exist I think I think we also I, I finally realized too we forget that Jimmy Stewart Henry Fonda all the major stars 
if you look at the tail end of their careers, TV, there, there's a lot of stuff that is forgotten about or not as kind of embarrassing for them. And they were doing the job, like you said. Not all of which is terrible, you know. Uh, some of which is okay, but some right. of which is embarrassing. You know, the magic of Lassie, where Jimmy Stewart sings about how we need Lassie. <laughs> That's not great, but it's also not uninteresting. Right. <laughs> I guess uh, to wind down, Ted, you wanted to. Did you have some movies you wanted to throw? Oh, I, I was re- looking through your your list, and I was just marveling at some stuff like your uh, take on Mask and Anonymous, the, <laughs> the Bob Dylan God, film. I knew this was going to come up. You, uh, uh, I'm a big Dylan obsessive, and uh, so I was really, I was like, I only like what, what found one review at the time when it came out that maybe liked it, and everybody else just dumped on it. And now you've you've kind of had a change of heart on it a little bit. It seems like. Yeah, I think, you know, I think when it, I saw it at Sundance, I was like, what the hell is this? And <laughs> I think, you know, uh, I, I said it was the Plan 9 of Dylan movies, you know, like I, the way say, same way I said that uh, James Toback's Black and White was the Plan 9 of race relation movies. Um, <laughs> I think it plays much more interestingly now. It's still kind of hard to sit through, um, <laughs> but it's also it has some very interesting moments when he's walking down those stairs or he's on that bus and he's going to walk down those stairs into that kind of like barrio of the forsaken and they're playing the song one more cup of coffee. And I'm like, this is really haunting, you know? Um, I I really want to see Ronaldo and Clara now, you know, it's just like one of those things um, where I find Dylan kind of, Utterly fascinating. Well, speaking of Ronaldo and Clara, uh, you didn't mind you the uh, Rolling Thunder movie. I know a lot of uh, viewers and critics and f- and fans that were just so upset that Scorsese, how dare they put these fake things in here? I was like, I saw it in a theater and I was watching it. I'm like, I don't remember this character. I, I know my Dylan history <laughs> pretty good. And then when he got to Michael Murphy, I go, oh, okay, I see what's going on. Yeah, and I, no, I, and mean, I, got, I got caught up in it. I enjoyed it. But man, it really pissed off a lot of folks. But what do these people think Dylan has been doing his whole career? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. all it's all masks. It's all masks. Even the sincere stuff is a mask in a way. Even even though it's sincere and moving, it's still a mask. It's all mask. You know, you look at "Don't Look Back" and you listen to him singing in that the songs he's singing, and and then he tosses off a song like love is just a four letter word, which is the most banal greeting card uh, sentiment imaginable. And people are marveling that he's able to do that, but that's still him. You know, he's all of those things. And uh, the put on artist is part of it. You know, the Joker, the Joker man, he is Joker man. Right. So yeah, I, I was I was really how about the uh, uh, hard ticket to Hawaii? I, I noticed that you gave. You, I love I, it. I love Andy Sedaris. I love anything he does. I just I think I, he's. How did you get hooked into him? Uh, just just uh, you know, I mean, I I've always liked trash. I mean, <laughs> when I was when I was growing up, I, uh, when I went to college, I went to Wayne, I went to William Patterson College, and I lived in Patterson uh, in '78, and it was a rough neighborhood, and I knew this guy. Very briefly, a guy named Don Markle, who used to just sort of, we nobody knew what he did or what he was doing. He hung around at college. He wasn't a student. He was a little older. He smoked a lot of weed. He drank a lot of bourbon. And he'd sit around at night smoking cigarettes, staying up till all hours of the morning, drinking, smoking cigarettes, and watching They Saved Hitler's Brain on <laughs> Channel 9. You know, I remember when... You know, the Medvets, Harry and Michael, put out the Golden Turkey book, and they had this film festival in New York called the World's Worst Film Festival. And then they would have, like, they saved Hitler's brain on a big screen. But I, Don Markle is this guy I knew in, like, 1977 when I first went to college. And he was all about horrible films and going to the plaza and seeing, you know, uh, 
Dracula's Dog, um, Horror High, and just getting is, is the first person I ever smoked pot with. And you just get really stoned and you'd watch these terrible movies. And he wanted to make a film. They, their apartment was right by the Patterson Falls. And they had this wrecked refrigerator that they were going to shoot it in 16 millimeter. They were going to like sh- throw the refrigerator into the Passaic River and, and, and film it going over the falls. And they were going to name the movie Blue Water White Kelvinator. <laughs> they had this idea that they were going to get their roommate. They had one roommate who didn't drink. And Gerald, and they wanted to get him killed uh, because there's a presidential motorcade that was actually scheduled to drive right past the house they lived in. They were going to get this guy drunk. They were going to spin him around three times. They were going to put a fake gun in his hand and they were going to push him out onto the front lawn just as the motorcade for President Ford was going by. And they were going to have the Secret Service kill him as a practical <laughs> joke. So uh, that didn't work out because it rained that day. So this was like my first <laughs> college friend. Uh, so he got me into bad movies. And then when the Medvets put out Golden Turkeys, and then when Michael Weldon, who became a good friend of mine in the 80s, put out the Psychotronic Encyclopedia film, this stuff, you know, I mean, there was a long time that Night of the Living Dead was considered a trash movie. So, you know, I... I I'll, 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 you know, I like, I always felt that part of the reason cinema is so great is because it is both a medium of high art and the lowest exploitation. And that sensationalism is built into cinema's appeal. It's the reason that the great train robberies ending is so amazing where the guy shoots his gun at the audience. This is an image that's repeated at the end of Goodfellas. Yeah. And it's pure sensationalism. And if you can't appreciate that as being part of cinema, then I don't think you really know cinema. So I'm open to anything. And Andy Sedaris's movies are hilarious. The whole idea of like these busty playboy playmates who can't act, wielding weaponry and killing guys, and then saying, "Well, let's go over the case in the hot tub," and they get in the hot, you know. And I rem- I sat through Hard Ticket to Hawaii with Andy Sedaris sitting next to me in New York at the Park Avenue screening room. And a bunch of my colleagues were sitting in front of me and they were losing their minds at everything about it. And Sedaris was getting kind of irritated because he's like, no, no, you don't understand. There's the big plot twist coming up. (laughs) The plot twist was the snake, the giant snake coming out of the toilet. So (laughs) I felt bad for him. But I mean, it was a really entertaining movie in its own way. And years later, at the first press screening of the Royal Tenenbaums, I'm at the Park Avenue screening room. I'm sitting in the same seat that I was sitting in watching Hard Ticket to Hawaii with Andy Sedaris. And who comes and sits next to me but Wes Anderson? And I said, I don't believe this. Many years ago, I was sitting in this theater watching a movie with the director sitting next to me. And it was, and he had no idea who Andy Sedaris was. <laughs> I, and I didn't really have time to go into it because the lights came down soon. But... Mm. Someday I'll I'll see Wes again and I'll I'll tell him all about it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean I love I love that stuff. You know I love uh, my a friend of mine who who who's uh, who does a fanzine about pulps. Um, he was really into Andy Sedaris and like he'd compare notes about the different acting skills of the different Playboy playmates he'd put in the films. Um, and they're all bad, <laughs> but they're very they're very game. I like that quality of just sort of being willing to put it all out there for Andy Sedaris. What about your quote? I got, I like this. Uh, I'm curious about your quote for uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. My thought upon leaving the screening was God damn him. He did exactly what I did not wish for. him. No, and I mean, I didn't and he made want me love him. It. I didn't want him to rewrite history that way. I thought it was sacrilege. Um, and yet he, because I didn't realize, even I didn't understand given the title that this was his, his Hollywood fairy tale. And that was during the last image, the overhead shot of, of Rick standing outside the gate of, of the Polanski Tate home. And it just says once upon a time, I'm like, Oh, of course, yeah. this is his, this is his way it wanted it to turn out. And, I thought, and that's, that's, and that's legitimate. 
and it's you know people it's it is a love letter uh so yeah i was very moved by it actually and i thought it was a, a blast and i also admire admired the fact that i came in prepared to be appalled and i was delighted i you know when an artist can do that that's um that's great artistry I've noticed you went you went through all the uh, recent Universal releases of Eastwood uh, from Kino Lober. Any uh, any new fresh take on those? Watching them again? You know, I listened to my friend Nick's commentary on the Iger sanction. That was very good. I recommend everybody listen to that when they see it. Uh, he's a good director. You know, uh, always has been. Misty is really as objectionable as it plays in certain aspects of it, it's a very assured piece of work. It's actually a lot fancier than in terms of cinematic style and language than he eventually became. He definitely distilled that because there's a lot of Hitchcock influence in it. But, um, you know, he's clearly, um, he's not a dilettante. Um, he's, he's a real director, you know, he, and, and, and he always has been. Have we had anybody that we can compare him to in, in cinema history, his career? Such a no, unique... I, think, I, th I think he's unique. Um, yeah. And I, I, uh, I am full of admiration for him. Always have been. Well, I guess the one last thing I wanted to ask was, since both of us enjoyed Made Men so much, are you, I mean, I, obviously you're going to be writing consistently, but uh, do you got any new book proposals out? Are you working on a new book? Is I that... hope to be working on a new book very soon, and I can't talk about it because the idea is still very fresh. Okay. The deal, sure. the deal is not yet made, but hopefully it'll be made soon. And I think it'll surprise some people, but it also has a logic that if you look at what I've done in Made Men, definitely made sense. So I'm looking forward to being able to share it. And I hope to be able to share it before the end of the year or by oh, the turn of the year. Cool. And uh, that's, that's something I'm looking forward to. I think one of the biggest charms for me of the book was how well you adapted to long form. And I, I, I can't wait for another book from you. So yes, that's yeah, same here. That's great. News. I had, I had fun doing it and I hope to have fun doing the next one. I hope to have more time to do the next one too. Hmm. Uh, Cause I had to do this one in about a year, which isn't not enough. Hmm. Well, certainly I think for anybody that's interested in films and, and just the, the, it's not one of those books you want. You want to read it more than once, I think, because there's so much info on there, and 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 watch it with the movie itself. So I that's think very it, kind. I appreciate that. Uh, Glenn Kenny, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. I'm so glad I did it.